Did you know that every year about 100 firefighters die in America trying to save people's lives? And then another 150 police officers die in the line of duty. In fact, going back to September 11th, we had about 400 emergency workers die during the 9-11 attacks. Why? Well, we have men and women in our country who risk their lives to help people when they are in danger. These people can't bear to watch someone else be destroyed without doing something about it. I want you to think about that this morning. Because if non-Christians, if secular men and women, are willing to risk their lives in order to save people who are in physical danger, how much more should you and I be willing to do whatever it takes to help those who are in spiritual danger? How is it that we can live our lives and just focus on ourselves or our job or our pleasures when people all around us are in danger of going to hell? This is how the Apostle Paul says it in Romans. I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul cannot bear to see the people around him destroyed. So he pleads with God on their behalf. That's the New Testament. Now we have a similar occurrence in the Old Testament. In Genesis chapter 18, God reveals to Abraham that God is going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham pleads for the lives that are inside. The Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? You know, there was a time in each one of our lives when it was us, right? We were the one that was in danger of God's wrath. It was once our lives that were on the line, but because of a family member or a friend or a camp counselor or a teacher, we were saved. And now we get to be here in church, singing God's praises and no longer afraid of death. And so we're relaxed, we're assured, and we just go back to our regularly scheduled lives. We focus on work and family and hobbies. In other words, now that we are saved, we go back to pursuing our own comforts and pleasures while the people all around us are still under the threat of judgment and death. Our Esther story is not over. True, Esther has saved herself. Haman is dead. Her uncle has been saved, but Esther does not use this moment as an opportunity to relax or ease up. Esther has been bold in her approaches with the king so far, bold in her requests, and so she rolls the dice with her life one more time, and she throws herself at King Xerxes' feet. Esther 8 says, Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the golden scepter to Esther, and she rose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? Esther says, how can I celebrate? How can I celebrate knowing that my people are still in danger of this rule? 
She can't just be happy that her own life is spared. She is past the point now where she is only concerned about her own safety. She can't go back to her old life being an out of touch queen. And so what happens? How does the book of Esther end? If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther and they have impaled him on the pole he set up. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you and seal it with the king's signet ring for no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. At once the royal secretaries were summoned on the 23rd day of the third month, the month of Sivan. They wrote out all Mordecai's orders to the Jews and to the satraps, governors, and nobles of the 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. These orders were written in the script of each province and the language of each people, and also to the Jews in their own script and language. Mordecai wrote in the name of King Xerxes, sealed the dispatches with the king's signet ring, and sent them by mounted couriers who rode fast horses, especially bred for the king. The king's edict granted the Jews in every city the right to assemble and protect themselves, to destroy, kill, and annihilate the armed men of any nationality or province who might attack them and their women and children, and to plunder the property of their enemies. The day appointed for the Jews to do this in all the provinces of King Xerxes was the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar. A copy of the text of the edict was to be issued as law in every province and made known to the people of every nationality, so that the Jews would be ready on that day to avenge themselves on their enemies. The couriers riding the royal horses went out, spurred on by the king's command, and the edict was issued in the citadel of Susa. When Mordecai left the king's presence, he was wearing royal garments of blue and white, a large crown of gold and purple robe of fine linen, and the city of Susa held a joyous celebration. For the Jews, it was a time of happiness and joy, gladness and honor, in every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came. There was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating, and many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. Wow, right? Wow, what a great ending to a great story. When we started Esther, I told you that there were some who would argue against having this book in the Bible because it never mentions God. And I had given you a few reasons it's included. Those were all Christian reasons but I want to give you a Jewish reason this story is included. The story ends with a celebration of victory and freedom, and that is the origin story of the Jewish holiday, Purim. Month that Purim takes place in is March. It's March right now. <laughs> and according to the scroll of Esther, they should make uh, them a day of feasting and gladness and of sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. Purim is celebrated among the Jews today. They exchange gifts of food and drink. They donate money to the poor. They have a big, huge celebration meal, and they publicly read the book of Esther. Other customs include wearing masks and costumes, very similar to our Halloween, and they have celebrations and parades. The book of Esther is the origin story of a celebrated Jewish holiday. It's a celebration where the people who are once condemned, but because of a savior who are rescued from death. And in less than a month, Christians will be celebrating that exact same feeling for a completely different reason and for a much more perfect savior, Easter is the day that death was defeated for all humanity. But I want to go back to Esther's plea to the king. 1 Peter 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. <clears throat> Listen, 
If you have been saved, it is because Jesus was not content to live for himself. He didn't rise from the dead to save his own skin. He suffered and he died and he pled your case before God. And that was for you. Jesus saw that every single one of us was in danger of death, in danger of punishment for sin. So he left heaven to go to the cross, to shed his blood, to save us. And if that's the case, don't you think we should be people who refuse to live our lives for ourselves as long as there are still others who are in danger of punishment? Don't you think we should be people who can't bear to watch the loved ones in our lives die under God's wrath? What can we learn from Esther in this moment? The people that we pass by every single day. They are not rich, they are not poor, they are not young, they are not old, they are not Republican, they are not Democrat. Each one of them is an immortal soul that is bound for judgment. Who will tell them the good news? Who will plead their case before the king? Who will intercede? When you think about it, Esther, she had way more to lose, right? She played with a king who she knew didn't care very much about other people. But you and I, we have free access to a king who we can approach at any time with our prayers, our petitions. Plus, we also have the benefit of knowing that our king does care, that he loves all his children. So knowing that, how much more should we be in prayer for our friends, our family members, our co-workers, the city officials, our, even our enemies, other countries, politicians? Xerxes listened to Esther and said, go ahead, write any law and I will sign it. But Mordecai knew that it wasn't enough to just write a law. If you write a law, where's it gonna go? On a bulletin board? or in a law book, right? Mordecai wanted it to be in every language and sent to every people group so that they knew it. For good news to work, people need to hear it. In verse nine, Mordecai writes a letter to every single city and town, and he has the news translated into every single language. More importantly, it says he translates the good news into Hebrew so that his own people know that they are saved. You know, there's one more people group we should add to our list of prayers. And it's our Hebrew brothers and sisters who are still celebrating Purim. They are still celebrating an Old Testament rescue. Those people who are feasting, they are remembering a foreshadowed cel celebration about a foreshadowed salvation when in fact they could be celebrating a current release from punishment. They could be celebrating a current victory, a current savior. They could be celebrating Easter with us. We need to pray for them to replace the goodness of Esther with the perfection of Jesus. Romans 10 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Why is it so hard for us to share our faith? Why is it so hard to invite someone to church? Probably because in our world today, somebody will say, you know, that's fine for what you believe. That's good for you, but it's not for me, right? So 
That leads us to ask, what does it take? What does it take to bring someone to Jesus? The answer is the same that it's always been. God's truth shared in love and friendship and illustrated in your daily life. You know, for more than 50 years, the Billy Graham crusade has been helping people share their faith with those same two things, friendship and relationships. And the simple plan they use for salvation, they call Operation Andrew. And they get the name from this verse, John 1. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. There you go. Andrew gives you the plan that can help you invite someone to church for Easter. First, you just take a minute and you identify those who need Christ. Ask God to reveal those people to you. They could be anyone that you think would benefit from being a part of your church family. Anyone you think needs to hear the gospel. And then just write their name on a card, put it someplace where you can see it every single day. And then second, pray for them. Pray for them. Pray that God will begin to show them their need for Christ and that the Holy Spirit will help you live your life in such a way that that person sees the difference that Christ makes in your life. And third, you start building bridges of friendship with them. Spend some time with them, have them over for dinner, play golf with them, go for coffee, listen to their problems. In other words, just be their friend. And then fourth, you either share the gospel with them at the right moment or invite them to Easter. As you listen to someone, as you are friends with them, God will eventually open the door for you to share your faith. The opportunity will come. It's either gonna come as a moment where you'll be able to give your testimony or where you'll be able to just say, hey, do you have Easter plans? Any one of those can be used as an opportunity for the Holy Spirit. Mark 4 says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. So, oh, if your friend is not receptive, if you don't see any progress, don't be discouraged. Continue to be a friend. The Bible says that the word of God is like a seed and it takes time for seeds to grow. When you are doing this, you are preparing the ground. You are watering the soil. You are not gonna change the person. You do not make the seed grow. God does that. So I wanna share some tips also if you are thinking about inviting someone to church or what church will be like on Easter morning. First, just ask them. <laughs> I know that seems obvious, right? Uh, we say, oh, well, how do I invite someone to church? Just ask them. It, it's probably obvious, but the first step is just asking them to come. I think it's easy to get caught up in the regular everyday Sunday service for us, and we forget to ask others to come along with us. We forget to and bring someone, but a personal invitation is still the number one way that people come to church. They will come because there's an existing connection already there. They'll come because they know you come. Most people feel more comfortable attending a church where they know somebody else who's already in attendance. It can help take away some of that anxiety of having to navigate the community on their own Plus, it gives them an opportunity to sit with somebody or go to somebody whenever they have questions. Second, you can use social media. Why else do you have a Facebook account, right? <laughs> use it. Social media can be another great way to bridge the gap between you and perhaps somebody who's a little uncomfortable coming to a church for the first time. Did you know that all of our sermon videos are on YouTube? <laughs> you probably did, right? <laughs> Well, of course, and you can clip and copy any one of the URLs up at the top of a video you're watching, post it to your Facebook wall and say something about it. That lets other people know where your faith is, what you do on a Sunday morning, where you attend. You can follow us on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. 
Sharing posts from your church or tagging posts in your church, this will help your friends know where you go to church. Just think, if you had been posting every single one of this series, the Esther series, if you had been posting those videos to your page and your friends even just casually see them and they don't watch them, they would at least have some sort of reference or starting point for a question. They would say, hey, I see your church is studying Esther, right? What do you think? I see you've been posting those videos. How have they been? What's it like? What do you like? We have Easter graphics on our Facebook page. Steal them. Use them on your own pages. Another tip is you can always make an announcement in your coffee club or book club or golf club or your swimming group. You know, when people ask, is there any news? Is there any announcements? Is there anything anybody else would like to share? Is there any new business? Remember Esther's boldness. Remember Esther's boldness. Stand and share events from your church. Don't assume that, well, there's a church locally, and if people wanted to go to it, they'll go to it. We, we can't assume that. Esther was not content to let people fend for themselves. Mordecai was not content to let good news sit on a bulletin board or in a book. It's our job to get the good news out there. And then, when it is Easter morning, give your guests your first five minutes. What does that mean? It means when you walk in, don't just find your seat and sit. Visitors to our church need to feel welcome. And studies say that most people will make up their minds about a new church within the first 30 seconds they come in your door. Whenever I visit another church, I always notice how many people actually talk to me. Many times people will look at you, but they'll just kind of ignore you. And if that happens in our church, guests will feel unwanted and they won't come back. Walmart has a 10-10 rule. Did you know that? Guests are greeted within the first 10 seconds, or if an employee is near a guest, they should address them if they're within 10 feet. If you discover a guest, introduce yourself, introduce your family, offer to help them with any questions they have, make them feel welcome. But even before you greet them, and this goes not just for Easter, but every single week, Give our guests the best seats in the house, right? If it were your house at home and people were coming over for dinner, wouldn't you give them the best seats in the house? Like I said, people make up their mind about a church right away. But what would you think if you were brand new and you walked into a church and you saw all the regulars sitting in the back? What would you think? You you would think, wow, nobody wants to sit up close. <laughs> and the second thing that tells them is, oh, I guess this is where we sit. You sit up there. You sit up front. You walk past all of us and you sit up front. We save those seats for you. But our guests, they're just like you. They prefer to sit in the aisle seat. They prefer to sit in the back. I don't know if you know this, but our sanctuary, a lot like other sanctuaries, tilts, which means the highest point of the church is in the back, the lowest point is in the front. I seem to remember Jesus saying once, when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place. So I think even Jesus is telling you to sit up front. <laughs> if you want to be a friendly church, reserve aisle seats and rear seats for guests. Tip number six, you should also give guests your last five minutes. At the end of a service, I know, people rush out of here to leave. But what if you hung around for just five minutes? You reconnected with that visitor, invited them to donuts and coffee, asked them how the service was, asked them encouraged questions, and say nice things like, it was nice to meet you, hope to see you next week. All of those things come together to help us become a friendly church to help us become more like the name of our church. We're a community church. Our text today deals with Esther's intercession for people that were her people. She was not content to let them suffer. She was not content to just 
allow them to be free and not tell them. She goes into the throne room of Xerxes and she enters in on the behalf of her people. And it's because of her intercession that she paints this beautiful foreshadowing of what will happen hundreds of years later with Jesus. As believers, we are now a royal priesthood, with each having access to the throne of grace. Esther also serves as a picture of the Holy Spirit because she intercedes on the behalf of believers who lack wisdom and who feel like they can't intercede for themselves. Now, I will admit many times I have no understanding of God's plan or how things work, but he always meets or he always exceeds my expectations. And he does that according to his divine will. We would do well to be patient, seek the Lord with our own petitions and wait for him to meet the needs according to his time and his will. Our text today beautifully illustrates the privilege of prayer that we all get to enjoy. We can go to our Lord at any time, with any need, knowing that he will hear our prayer. He may not always answer in the time frame we desire or in the manner we hoped, but he will always answer according to his will. We have access to the throne of grace anytime we need, and our King loves to set people free. Let's pray together. Lord, right now, as we are standing on the edge of Esther, we are also standing at the beginning of Easter, looking forward to the services that come, Good Friday, Palm Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, telling the story of your sons last week on earth, the cross, and the resurrection. Lord, we know preparations are being made for every church across the world to share this story, the most important story ever told. We pray that churches everywhere are packed to the edges, filled with friendly, smiling faces who offer hope, acceptance, and grace to each who attends. May your Son receive glory and honor. Amen. Hey, I want to tell you about Easter. So we'll have services on uh, Palm Sunday, of course, at 9.30 and 11. That same week, we'll have a Good Friday service at 6.30 p.m. here in the sanctuary, and we will be serving you communion. It's a somber time, and we'll be talking about the cross. And then resurrection morning, we have three services, the first at 7 at the Walden Yacht Club flagpole, and uh, rain, rain permitting. So if there's rain, we, we cancel it, of course. We're not going to make you sit in the rain. But uh, it's a beautiful morning to, to watch the sunrise and to have an Easter service. And then we'll have two services back here at the church, one at 9 o'clock and one at 11. We hope to see you there. Have a blessed Easter.